context. So um, with that, so um, I'm going to jump into my slides here. So the gypsy moth, um, you know, one of the things that's obviously important to keep in mind is that the gypsy moth is an example of a non-native species, that its uh, native range includes uh, most of temperate um, Europe and Asia as well as uh, North Africa. Um, and so in North America, it's a non-native species. Um, and as such, it really reflects uh, part of a much larger problem, which is this problem of non-native forest insects um, that we're experiencing here in North America. That um, This is probably maybe a graph that some of you have seen. We get about um, uh, two and a half new species of non-native insects establishing every year. And of those, uh, about one-fifth of them are, are damaging species, so we get a damaging non-native forest insect uh, every other year. And gypsy moth is certainly one of the first. We think that it originally came in, in around the uh, 1860s. And that's when you can see some kind of switch went off and we started uh, accumulating species in North America. And of course, um, you know, the gypsy moth, the fact that, that um, we, we have, they're literally, we think there are probably over 400 non-native insects in, in North America, but gypsy moth is one of the handful that cause problems, and, it, uh, be, and this is because it exhibits these rather spectacular um, outbreaks. And one of the things that, uh, compared to a lot of um, other non-native insects, which is interesting about the gypsy moth, is that um, in its native range, uh, the gypsy moth actually also has outbreaks. So you can, some of the other uh, problematic non-native insects we have in North America, things like emerald ash borer or uh, hemlock lily adelgid, you go back to their native range and they're very benign. They don't, you, you essentially never find them because they're very, they're not problematic at all for one reason or another. But gypsy moth is unusual that in, in through much of, of Europe and Asia, the species is quite problematic and, and, uh, you can see outbreaks of the gypsy moth and especially in Europe, a lot of the, uh, Europe, Mediterranean area, um, as well as in Asia, a lot of, of, of parts of both East Asia and Central Asia. It's quite a bit of a problem. And I've, collected this, this list of, of names that people have for the gypsy moth in different parts of, of the world. Uh, my favorite, of course, is, is probably um, this, um, the one that they use in uh, Slovakia, which is the nun with the big head, which is one of the things I, I like to call the gypsy moth that too. So, so being a, a non-native insect, um, it's, it's actually a great uh, model system for kind of looking at the kind of the whole problem of biological invasions, and I'll, I always like to use this, there's the same process that, that basically all uh, insects, non-native species goes through of the initial arrival, uh, followed by establishment, and, and then eventually spread. And, and with the gypsy moth, I'll kind of step through how these processes have progressed because, again, I think it's sort of a good model system for understanding the, the biological invasion problem in general. Um, and of course, the other thing that's kind of interesting about the, you know, uh, differentiating between this, these stages of arrival, establishment, and spread um, is that there are, you know, different types of, of management actions that, that we use of quarantine inspection, uh, surveillance, eradication, barrier zones. And we, we do all these for, for the gypsy bomb. So uh, it's, again, a nice system for, for seeing how the, those types of management activities uh, work. So, um, the, the initial, the, the arrival stage for, for the gypsy moth, it really started um, in either 1868 or 1869 um, near Boston, Massachusetts. Um, um, and in, in contrast to a lot of um, non-native species, we, we some, very often have some kind of vague idea about how they got there. But the gypsy moth, it's another really kind of cool thing about this species is that we, we pretty much know exactly how it got there. We know exactly whose fault it was. Um, and it was this guy, Etienne Leopold Trivolo, who was a, um, he was actually employed uh, at the time of his gypsy moth accident. He was a commercial artist. Um, and he was living in the, the suburb of, of, um, of Boston in Medford. Um, and, um, you hear a lot of stories about, about gypsy moth. You'll hear people say that he wanted to use the gypsy moth um, to breed it, um, cross it with native silkworms to produce silk. I don't think that's probably, I, I've done quite a bit of research on the guy. I don't think that's completely right. I think he basically, he had an amateur insect interest in insects. He, he was, he did actually publish a couple of papers about native silkworms. Um, but uh, I think he basically was the kind of guy 
who liked to raise any kind of insect he could his hands on. I, I have some friends that are like this. And so uh, it, it would appear that he had made a, he was originally from France, um, and he uh, apparently went back to France for a trip and brought some gypsy moth egg masses with him. And he was rearing them in his, the, there was actually a forested area in the back of his house. Um, and it was on, uh, in Medford, Massachusetts, and where he was apparently rearing all kinds of other insects. And something happened and the, these insects got loose. Um, apparently he did, we know that he notified a lot of the local authorities in Massachusetts and no one really um, cared about it very much at all um, and, and until um, about a little more than 10 years later, which was when um, the first gypsy moth outbreak started on, on Truvelo Street in, in Medford. And there's actually a great book. If any of you have ever run across this book, it's called uh, The Gypsy Moth. It was published in 1896 by Forbish and Fernald. And they recount in, in very nice detail of the stories that a lot of, here's Truvelo's house was here, and they recount stories that a lot of Truvelo's neighbors in his neighborhood had as the initial um, outbreak moved through his neighborhood. Like Again, he actually in introduced it in 1869, 1868 or 1869. The first outbreaks uh, started in the 1880s. Um, and so, but it wasn't somewhere around 1890, the, the um, state of Massachusetts decided that, that um, they were going to try to do something about this. And they made an, a very valiant attempt to eradicate the gypsy moth from uh, Massachusetts. Um, uh, and in fact, to be, it's an interesting thing. Back at that time, the whole concept of eradication was pretty unknown. No one had really successfully done it for any insect. Um, and, and in fact, we actually think this is probably the first eradication, <laughs> insect eradication attempt ever ta undertaken. Um, you can see, you know, they had pretty primitive measures to, they didn't have very uh, advanced methods for, for controlling the gypsy moth. And so unfortunately by 1900, the, the the effort failed, and and we considered by 1900 the the species was essentially established um, in this area around Boston, um, and so the 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 story subsequent to that is the gypsy moth has essentially continued to expand its range, um, uh, starting uh, here in Boston in the late 1800s, and then um, gradually expanding throughout um, uh, North America. Um, one of the reasons. Um, why we think that the gypsy moth, it, it, when you compare it with a lot of other insects, its spread has is, is been relatively slow. And we think the reason for that is because, as I'll mention later, the, the females, we have the, the strain of, of gypsy moth that Truvelo brought with them from Europe, the females are flightless. And so they're, they have very limited ability to, to move. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so that's kind of the story of how gypsy moth spread. Um, a few other things I could mention about this historical information is that um, from the period of, of 1910 uh, through um, the early 1960s, there were various attempts to, to um, uh, implement barrier zones to, to prevent the gypsy moth from spreading um, farther uh, westward. Um, and this is just one map that was from the early 1900s. And, and this is actually a type of a pheromone trap they had. That back then they knew that females produced a, a pheromone that attracted males and they put the live females in this cage and they, they knew that it was a very powerful method for, um, for detecting uh, outlying gypsy moth populations. Um, and these, these efforts, uh, but you can imagine they were, they were still slightly limited in the technology they had, but of course things kind of kicked into high gear um, following world, uh, world War II with the discovery of DDT and uh, basically, people figured out that you could, if you sprayed DDT out of an airplane, you could really kill a lot of gypsy moths. And so they, there was kind of a big, a massive error of, in some years, they sprayed over a million acres with, with DDT. Um, um, and uh, uh, it, it, you know, obviously didn't, they failed in, in, in stopping the spread. But the other thing that it actually, uh, it, it did actually produce a, a fairly significant outcry from the public that, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with Rachel uh, Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, but if you ever open it up, there's actually a whole chapter on the gypsy moth called Indiscriminately from the Skies, in which they talk about this massive aerial spraying of, of DDT and, and the impacts it may be um, having um, 
uh, on the environment. And so the, the, the history of, of, of gypsy moth management is sort of tangled up in, in the uh, various stages of the environmental uh, movement in the United States as well. Um, so um, the, kind of finishing with the history, I'm going to sort of switch gears and just talk a little bit about some basic biology. Um, so the, the gypsy moth has one life stage, uh, one uh, goes through one generation per year, and this time of year, you, they they spend most of the year, in fact, in the uh, egg stage. The, the the females in the in the late summer lay their eggs in a, in a large mass, which is a a, a, a matrix of of eggs and and frothy hair-like material from the abdomen. Um, they if you if you're out in the field, um, you sometimes will see new egg masses. The current year egg masses, which are the sort of darkish beige. Uh, to be distinguished from the older egg masses, um, which are typically more weathered and look like this, um, that are from previous years, and, and typically you can differentiate them if you if you push on the new egg mass, it's it's quite firm, the current year egg mass, whereas the ones from previous years are, are very spongy since the eggs have already hatched. Um, the other thing, if you see an egg mass out in the field, you'll you'll notice uh, there's a, a couple species of egg parasitoids that. Um, uh, are, were introduced for control of gypsy moth, and um, they go through several generations, both in the fall um, and in and in spring. And uh, most eggs are laid on the trunks of trees, especially like underneath branches. Um, but one of the things I'll, I'll mention later, there's unfortunately a tendency for gypsy moth to lay eggs on all kinds of other weird stuff that might be in the forest, things lying on the ground like picnic tables, logs, and this sort of thing. So. Um, um, and so in the spring, usually, and it depends, of course, where you are, but once, right around the time of, of bud break, of leaf bud break, um, egg masses hatch. And you'll get, um, each egg mass may contain, you know, somewhere between 300 to 1,000 eggs. And, and the, the larvae, the first instar larvae will hatch out. Um, they usually remain on the egg mass for a day or two. And then they start crawling away, and they'll spin up into the foliage and, and um, usually spin down on silken threads. And they blow in the wind and disperse some ways to find hosts. Um, when they start feeding, they'll start feeding. And, and this is actually, it, when you're in an area with high densities of gypsy moths, you get this sort of shotgun effect because the early instars will actually start feeding on the expanding um, leaves and buds from buds, and when they do that, essentially with sort of one bite, they can take enough foliage that leaves a sort of shotgun hole in the leaf as it expands. Um, and so as through the through the summer, the, the larvae keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, they go through five to six instars, and of course, most of the foliage is fed on by these late instars that are, are very big. They have are characterized by the blue dots on their uh, thoracic segments and red dots on, on their abdomen. Oh, I meant to throw in there a slide here of, of, of what is not a gypsy moth. Unfortunately, a lot of people do get confused. They'll confuse um, things like um, forest temp caterpillar or fall webworm with gypsy moth because there are a lot of other types of native insects that are uh, hairy caterpillars that you find in the forest. And what the important thing, uh, and a lot of people make this mistake, is that it, gypsy moths, even though they do spin uh, silk, they do not make any kind of silken uh, feeding um, a tent or aggregation. Um, they feed solitarily, you know, solitarily. They don't, they don't aggregate. And so anytime you see large silken um, uh, tents or any of this type of thing, that's not a gypsy moth. Um, so uh, one of the things that, that's also interesting about the gypsy moth is that um, in most populations, they actually feed on the foliage during the night. Um, and then they they come down in 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 the um, in the morning they'll, they'll the larvae will crawl down out of the, the foliage canopy and they seek out um, cryptic resting sites very often in in bark crevices or some of them will even crawl all the way down to the forest floor and and will hide under logs. We, we don't really know why they do this. To be honest, <laughs> evolutionarily, it must we we tend to think that they're maybe trying to avoid predation by birds or perhaps perhaps. Uh, parasitism. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is during very high density uh, populations, the larvae basically stop doing this diurnal migration and they'll, and they'll feed continuously 24 hours a day. Um, so, uh, and then finally, um, uh, usually, again, depending on where you are, the, the, they'll, the larvae will pupate. 
um, and they typically they pupate in um, essentially the last resting site. So, like as I mentioned before, a lot of the the larvae will will crawl down out of the canopy and rest in like a bark crevice. Of, uh, very often, you'll find pupae in these bark crevices or even down uh, lower on. And then essentially, the, the pupal period will last. Um, you know, maybe somewhere between uh, one and two weeks, and then the the adults emerge. The the, um, the males, of course, have these large plumose antennae, which we know are very effective for for males locating the the flightless females. Um, and uh, they they will mate, and then the the females will lay uh, egg masses. And again, most of the egg masses are actually laid in these same, really the same locations where the larvae may have crawled down out of the trees and sought these these cryptic resting sites like bark crevices, um, and then that's where the, they'll pupate, and then that's because the females don't fly very often, that's where they'll lay egg masses, um, which would be mostly, again, on the trunks of trees, but some will be down on objects on the forest floor, like logs or, or that sort of thing, where they may crawl and, and seek resting sites. Um, in, in the early 1900s, there was actually a, a very large effort to um, introduce biological control agents for for the gypsy moth, and that included um, they introduced several species of non-native um, um, crabbed ground beetles, um, both uh, from Europe and Asia, but also several uh, parasitoid species, uh, both flies um, as as well as, as hymenopterous parasitoids, um, and and in pretty much any population where you, in North America where you find the gypsy moth, you'll find uh, some fraction of the population. Uh, is always going to be parasitized. There, we have both egg parasitoids and uh, larval parasitoids in the gypsy moth. Um, and in terms of, of sort of understanding the population dynamics of this insect, um, you know, this is one of those things that I, I've devoted a lot of my career to try to understand gypsy moth population dynamics, and I, I'd have to be slightly embarrassed to say that we really don't fully understand what causes populations to go up and down. This is unfortunately the case for a lot of other forest insects. A lot of uh, the gypsy moth, like a lot of other forest insects, they're uh, basically in quite complex food webs. And um, but we we do have a lot of information. And one of the things we we generally think that the two most important categories of of mortality are uh, generalist predators and pathogens. Um, and the generalist predators are particularly important. At very when the gypsy moths are in very low densities, and the most important predators are are small mammals, particularly in North America, uh, deer mice, which are in the the genus Paramiscus, and um, we know that these Paramiscus species um, are able to feed on both gypsy moth larvae and pupae, and they can consume huge numbers of of, of gypsy moths, um, and um, uh, and one of the things that's interesting about this system is that we know that the so the densities of small mammals seem to have a lot to do with understanding when gypsy moth populations make this transition into outbreak modes. And the densities of small mammals themselves are very closely tied to um, to mass seeding, the production, the year, you know, the, with with oaks. Um, uh, the, the most paramiscus, a lot of the deciduous forests in the eastern U.S., they rely on oaks for as an overwintering food supply, and and oaks exhibit this phenomenon of mass seeding, where some years they produce a lot of uh, seeds, and others they don't produce many, and the small mammals seem to track that those mass seeding, and so it's a quite a complex thing that we we think um, that that weather can actually influence gypsy moth population dynamics, uh, you know, even directly by um, a lot of things like we know cold winter temperatures aren't good for overwintering egg masses, but then there can be effects on the small mammal predators as well as at mass seeding. So it's a quite a complex uh, system. Um, um, but as I mentioned um, earlier, at, at high densities, the small mammals seem to be um, pretty insignificant because there are basically these only the, the ability of the predators to consume gypsy moths is very quickly satiated by gypsy moths. There's just so many gypsy moths of high densities. And when, even though parasitoids do be, play a role in high density gypsy moths, we tend to think that, that the major fluctuations in gypsy moth dynamics are driven by uh, pathogens. And for, for uh, most of the time that, that people have been studying gypsy moths in North America, there's really been only one major pathogen, and that's a virus, this uh, gypsy moth nucleopyrohedrosis virus. 
um, and, which causes these epizootics at very high densities, and you get this phenomenon of where the, the cat, dead caterpillars, they droop in this sort of inverted V um, uh, 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 position. Um, but then uh, all the, there's, we now have a second, a very important pathogen here, a fungal pathogen, uh, Anamophaga mymiga. And it's a, many of you may know the story that it's a, it's a species that was really only previously known to exist in, um, in, in Japan and parts of China. Um, and then uh, there was actually an attempt to introduce in the early part of the 1900s. It was thought to be unsuccessful. And then all of a sudden in 1989, it showed up uh, almost throughout the gypsy moths range. And no one really knows whether it was a new introduction or just sort of went through some sort of genetic mutation that became more virulent. But now, if you go in the field, Enomophica is probably more common than, than, than the uh, virus. And it seems to be playing a very important role in gypsy moth dynamics. Um, the other th that um, um, the other thing is the fungus seems to be more uh, dependent on on moisture that, that the populations do better with uh, higher moisture conditions. So, which is not something that seemed to be true for the the, um, the virus. So, if you look at the dynamics of gypsy moths, it's a really interesting thing. This is this is actually a plot. Um, the pink line here are the fluctuations on on a linear scale. The, the yellow ones are on a log scale. And one of the things that statistically we see that there is a 10-year a, um, period, uh, periodicity. And there's obviously a lot of variation. But essentially every 10 years we get a big outbreak. We got a, a really big outbreak in the early 1980s, a really big outbreak in the early 1990s. Um, we had a significant blip in, in um, the early uh, 2000s and again in uh, uh, the last few years. Um, and then the, the other thing that we see is, is what we call a subharmonic peak. So on the years, the f every five years, we see a, a sort of smaller uh, blip in between the, the, the larger blips, which is a curious <laughs> phenomenon. But, and, and as I mentioned before, we don't completely understand what causes the, the, these uh, apparent um, uh, oscillations in, in gypsy moth populations, but we think that the main player in causing the crashes is, is is disease. So we think that the disease plays a really important role in the dynamics. One of the interesting things, as I mentioned before, this enomoth this fungal pathogen enomophaga showed up um, all of a sudden emerged around early, early, uh, 1989, um, and you can see since then we haven't had a really big outbreak. We but we do keep getting um, good outbreaks. Uh, last year I don't have this uh, graph updated, but last year we had. Um, I think over a million acres of defoliation, um, mostly in Pennsylvania um, and in in um, New Jersey, and it looks like this year the the, the populations might be a little higher, and there's going to be uh, quite a bit of suppression going on this year. It looks like. Um, so um, let's see. So the other thing, which is really I think a characteristic thing about gypsy moth outbreaks, is you get the outbreaks tend to be very much regional phenomenon. That is that these outbreaks are synchronized over a very large area. So in these kind of big year, big outbreak years, the defoliation extends for, for uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, sometimes, which is, is really the reason why uh, people, um, you know, why gypsy moth is, is so much of a problem. Um, getting back a little bit to biology again, that we, we consider gypsy moth to be a polyphagous um, uh, insect. That is, it, it, it feeds on many different species of trees. We know that it's capable of feeding on literally hundreds of species, uh, tree, tree species, um, but there are some tree species they, that they favor more than others. And in, in North, eastern North America, oaks have, have always been, this, the, the genus uh, Quercus has always been the, the species that's probably fed on the most, but certainly aspens um, um, and, and other species are are also really good gypsy moth hosts. Um, there are other species that um, really gypsy moths won't touch, uh, things like yellow poplar. Um, they're kind of like rocks in terms of gypsy moths. They, they really just won't feed on them. And then there's a, a group in between which are we consider resistant, but the gypsy moth larvae will feed on them. But uh, typically what we see is that the early instars, they only feed on the susceptible tree species. Um, and um, the, the late instars will generally feed on these um, these late these sort of uh, uh, resistant or, or moderately preferred um, tree species. Um, 
And the other thing, which I'll mention later in terms of sort of understanding stamp susceptibility, it's, it's really the proportion of the, these uh, genera represent in a stand that determine the stand susceptibility of a gypsy moth. But certainly one of the things that you see during a gypsy moth outbreak is this big difference of, you know, here these are defoliated oats which are totally stripped and you'll see a yellow poplar which doesn't have any feeding damage at all. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the, the probability of defoliation is really closely related to the fraction of, of preferred hosts in the stand. Um, and we refer to this as uh, stand susceptibility. Um, which refers to the, sort of the probability that the gypsy moth would defoliate a stand. Um, we also talk about stand vulnerability, which refers to the, the probability that, that uh, trees will be, uh, will die as a result of uh, defoliation. And it's important to kind of keep those, this has to do with defoliation, this has to do with dying. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned before, Susceptibility is really mostly determined by the, the fraction of, of gypsy moth hosts. Um, the, pretty much, if a stand doesn't have at least 20% of preferred species, eat, you know, so for example, oaks, then it's very unlikely that you'll get any defoliation in that stand. Um, and so most of the defoliation tends to be in these areas of 20% or more um, host, preferred hosts in a stand. Um, the other thing that one of the things you notice, um, and this has certainly been the experience in the central Appalachians, is that very often um, you get defoliation, start concentrated on the ridge tops, um, and and this has to do in part. Um, this is probably the area with with most um, highest uh, oak densities. Um, but there may be other factors at all. That, that very, it, there does seem to be this phenomenon that. In, in drier stands, so for example, stands with with more uh, 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 with sandy so sandy or rocky soils, that um, gypsy moth outbreaks seem to be more frequent. This may actually have to do. We don't really know for sure, but it may have to do with the, the these sites are lower quality for uh, small mammal populations. Um, following gypsy moth defoliation. Usually, in most cases, most trees survive. That is, that most broadleaf trees have the ability to be defoliated once and then most of these trees if they if they get more than say 30% defoliation 30 or 40% defoliation they put out a second flush of leaves in the same year and they can can still photosynthesize um, uh, but we do see this occasional what we call catastrophic tree mortality that is where you get uh, most of the of the basal area and the stand die um, and this is just one example of, of that. And to be honest, it's actually quite difficult to predict this, these kind of catastrophic events like this. Um, um, that um, is I'm really, in terms of understanding why you get heavy tree mortality in some areas and not others, we do know that a lot of it is just simply the number of years of defoliation. That is that most, in most trees and most stands can survive one year of defoliation. Uh, without dying, but and so once you get two to three years uh, consecutive years of defoliation, that's um, when we see a lot of trees dying. Um, things like uh, drought um, and uh, late frost can also uh, be uh, confounding factors. That uh, a lot of times uh, there's instances where uh, defoliation coincides with a drought year, and you see very extensive uh, tree mortality. And of course, the other thing that you see is that trees that already have Poor crown condition are much more likely to, to die uh, given a given level of, of defoliation. Um, and then finally, the other thing is the important role of secondary agents that, that we know um, the gypsy moth itself rarely kills a tree, but what it does is it, it weakens a tree and allows um, other agents, um, such as Armillaria melia, the shoestring root rot, to come in and actually kill a tree. Um, we also see um, Large numbers in areas that have been heavily defoliated, large numbers of the tutelane chestnut or Agrylus bilinianus. That um, many of you may recognize this genus Agrylus as being the same genus of, as the uh, emerald ash borer. And uh, Agrylus bilinianus is a native Agrylus. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting that we actually have seen this that sometimes when you get large numbers of, of, of um, gypsy moth defoliated trees during an outbreak, you actually get a little outbreak of this Agrylus bilineatus. And, and again, it's usually colonizing, colonizing trees that have been, are essentially on, in the process of dying. But when you get a huge uh, 
a number of these agrilus uh, during an outbreak, they can actually move on and start killing uh, pretty healthy trees. So it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, another impact of gypsy multifoliation is impact on, on uh, mass. So for example, in oaks, um, in, in years where you have heavy defoliation, you can get a pretty much a complete loss of, of seed production. Um, and this is something that um, is a concern um, for impacts on wildlife. Um, and uh, uh, so although in terms of understanding that the gypsy moths um, impact on, on wildlife species, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag because um, uh, the, as I mentioned before, just, you know, defoliation can have an adverse effect on hard mass like acorns, but then we know it can also have actually some beneficial effects. It can open up and, and provide more light to some species like rubrus that provide soft mass and may provide uh, 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 mortality, may provide uh, uh, snags that promote uh, nesting for certain bird species. So the effect on wildlife is there is basically some sort of pluses and minuses. It's not a simple thing. Um, so in terms of, you know, when you're looking at overall impacts in, in general, gypsy moth, um, uh, you know, we, you definitely, there are concerns about impacts in, in high value oak stands um, because there is this phenomenon, phenomenon of, uh, of, um, of uh, catastrophic mortality where we have very large amounts of trees dying. But as I mentioned before, that's kind of the exception to the rule. But obviously, if, if you have a high value uh, timber and you lose it, the, the trees uh, typically start degrading quite quickly after dying. And so you may lose quite a bit of value. Um, but if you look at kind of the big picture, the, 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 these uh, timber impacts are probably dwarfed in terms of the impacts on these um, non-market values. Um, in particular, um, uh, I'll say a few things about um, uh, water um, uh, watershed management, but also impacts on uh, recreation um, and um, residential impacts. Um, and but I will say that these these are the if you when economic studies show that these these impacts are really where in terms of the economics that's the, the biggest impacts. Um, one of the things during a gypsy moth outbreak, it's been shown that the, the defoliation, essentially the conversion of of, of leaves into frass, which is uh, excrement to the, which falls to the forest floor, that this can cause a, a quite rapid rate of, of nitrogen leaching. And when that nitrogen runs off into, into streams or into water supplies, there are actually a few cases of where um, municipal uh, lakes are used as supplies for water. Uh, drinking water, they've gotten um, uh, al uh, blooms of uh, uh, algae and other organisms that have, have caused uh, orders that to require boiling of water uh, because of concerns about uh, E. coli and other organisms. Um, but um, it's a relatively rare thing. Um, really, the, the biggest impact, I would say, of, of gypsy moth are, are really the visual impacts. Um, and and part of, some of these are recreational impacts during the outbreak. Um, very often, just the, the, the defoliation itself is unsightly, um, but also the large numbers of, of caterpillars, things, these are uh, dead caterpillars and excrement. It's, it's not really a fun thing to, to uh, be recreating in. Um, but probably the, the biggest impact of gypsy moth outbreaks is on, on um, homeowners. Um, that, that uh, many people um, in the eastern United States like to live in, in forested areas. And during gypsy moth outbreaks, this defoliation uh, as I mentioned before, you, you know, sometimes you do get tree mortality, which obviously if it, you have a tree, high value tree dying, that's kind of a big deal. But even the defoliation itself and the large numbers of caterpillars that during outbreaks you get large numbers of, of uh, caterpillars crawling around looking for food. And this is something that, that, that people don't like. Um, and I would say that it's interesting, it's one of the things about gypsy moth, the fact that it's a, a big hairy caterpillar that it, it does tend to evoke uh, sort of entomophobic tendencies in a lot of people. And, and so uh, the result of this is that uh, many people, uh, you know, we, we saw this just this last summer uh, in uh, the Pocono Mountain region of, of Pennsylvania, that um, 
in, in these forested residential areas, people uh, they become outraged. And and interestingly, one of the things they they say is is how could the government allow this to happen, and why isn't the government spraying their property? Um, and so it, it, it's it's a, a problem that, that creates a lot of public interest and demand for, for both local and state governments to, to do something. Um, and so this brings me into sort of the last part of, of my talk, which is talking about uh, gypsy moth management. Um, and and really we have, when we talk about gypsy moth management, there are really three types of, of management. There's um, uh, uh, detection and eradication, there's slow to spread, and there's suppression. So I'll say, uh, a little bit about detection and eradication um, first. Um, so one of the things I mentioned is that uh, earlier is that gypsy moth unfortunately has this tendency to lay egg masses on all kinds of weird um, things, and this includes things like picnic tables, but also automobiles, and this unfortunately means that people move gypsy moth around, especially when they're moving around the country. Um, and um, so. There's a, a very large and actually quite successful effort that's um, mostly funded by the um, uh, by USDA APHIS Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Um, who APHIS works cooperatively with the states in the uninfested region of the United States, essentially to to keep gypsy moth from establishing in these new areas. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, every year people accidentally move gypsy moth out of the out of the um, infested area here in the Northeast, and they move them to places like, uh, you know, Oregon, Washington, California, all parts of the West. And and there are every year over over 100,000 pheromone traps that are placed in these uninfested states to detect new populations. Um, and this is a very effective program because these pheromone traps, we know they're very effective at detecting new newly established populations. And so basically the way it works is in these uninfested areas, there's essentially sort of a it's not necessarily a grid of traps, but a base network of grids, a, a grid of traps that are put out. And when they detect gypsy moth in one of these areas, again, these initial uh, finds are usually a result of people accidentally moving gypsy moth into these uninfested areas, uh, either through household moves or some other recreational vehicles, and they start reproducing and, and making this isolated colony. So when it's detected, the next year, um, the uh, State and, and federal agencies uh, will deploy a higher density of traps to delimit the population. And then usually in the third year, based on this information, well, one thing is a lot of times when they come back the second year, nothing's there. They, they essentially, the populations go extinct with no intervention. But that's a good thing. But unfortunately, a lot of them do persist, and so then they'll come in and, and treat those populations to eradicate them. Um, historically, um, most of those treatments, oh, well, I can see this, this is actually a graph of, of eradication project, projects over time. Um, and you can see that if you compare eradication projects over time with defoliation in the Northeast over time, that you can see that when basically when we have a big blip of defoliation, you tend to see these big blips in numbers of eradication projects. And this makes sense that when there's a, the populations are really high in the eastern U.S., this is when people accidentally start moving gypsy moths to the West. Um, so most of the, um, th this is actually a map showing where historical eradication project projects have been. You can see the Pacific states are areas where a lot of these projects have been, but uh, the, uh, the areas closer to the generally infested area, particularly the southeast, is an area where we continue to see these isolated gypsy moth populations turning up. We tend to think that these are mostly the result of household moves. Some, at least some of these, a lot of these, Isolated populations are also um, household moves, people accidentally moving gypsy moth, but some of them may also be things like firewood, uh, uh, gypsy moth egg masses accidentally transported on firewood. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the th reasons why, well, one of the things I should mention is, is that virtually, with the exception of one uh, gypsy moth, uh, there in, in the 1960s there was one uh, isolated infestation in central Michigan that where eradication was attempted and it failed. Uh, with the exception of that project, literally there have been hundreds of other eradication projects for the gypsy moth, and all of them have been eventually successful. Um, and I think one of the reasons why they're so successful is because these pheromone traps work so well that they they really work that if you put a trap in an area where gypsy moth populations are 
are established and reproducing, you pretty much will always detect a male. And that's why this, this insect, compared to a lot of uh, other insects, uh, it, it's a relatively easy insect to eradicate. Uh, it's easy for me to say it's easy, but it, a lot of, it's a lot of work that goes into it. But the technology is definitely there to eradicate this, successfully eradicate this insect. Um, so let me step now into the, sort of the second um, type of management, which is uh, what we call the slow to spread. Uh, uh, slow to spread, which is basically the the, the objective of eradication is to to completely eliminate um, gypsy moth populations in these uninfested area. The slow to spread project is is a little bit, it's related to eradication, but a little bit different. The obje objective of a slow spread is, is simply to slow the spread of the gypsy moth. We know that we can't stop it, but we, we believe that we can actually slow the spread of the, of the insect. And by doing so, it creates a lot of benefit for places where gypsy moth is not yet established because um, uh, once gypsy moth becomes established in the area, uh, you know, people suffer the impacts and they spend a lot of money managing it. And so the longer you can uh, postpone the establishment of the insect, there's a clearer economic benefit to that. And the way the, the Gypsy Moth Slow to Spread project is a project largely funded by the U.S. Forest Service that's been in place since 1999. And it's basically consists of a 100 kilometer band uh, we call the action area that runs from the Canadian border all the way to the, to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, and in that, in that band, um, uh, basically pheromone traps are deployed to detect uh, isolated uh, populations that form just ahead of the infested front. And it's based on the, on the idea that we know that, that gypsy moth, uh, the way gypsy moth spreads is that it spreads by people accidentally moving uh, uh, life stages ahead of the infested front, and those life stages will then form colonies, which then grow over time. Um, and so the concept of this is if we can find and knock these populations back, um, we can greatly reduce the rate at which gypsy moth spreads. We know that we can't sort of push this infested area back, but by treating relatively small areas, we can greatly reduce the rate of spread. Um, and, and this just gives you, this is actually some of the trapping data that's been interpolated. You can, again, you see these isolated infestations that exist just ahead of the expanding population front. So the objective is to find those and then uh, treat them. So very similar to what we see with gypsy moth uh, eradication. That is that in the gypsy moth slow spread program, there's a, a two kilometer base grid over this 100 kilometer grid uh, 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 barrier action area. And when a population is detected, then usually the next year there's a higher density of traps put in to delimit the population, and then that isolated population will then be treated. Um, in contrast to, to eradication, though, which uh, in, in eradication, most of the treatments um, um, in these uh, distant isolated uh, populations like California and, and uninfested areas in the southeast, most of the, the treatments are done using uh, bacterial pesticide bacillus serinogenesis, BT. Um, for, um, in, in the slow spread program, the vast majority of the treatments are done using mating disruption, and which I don't know if this is a, it's a real success story for the gypsy moth um, that the, in most treatments that they use a, uh, a plastic laminate, these little uh, pheromone flakes, we call them, which are basically tiny pieces of plastic with the synthetic pheromone um, uh, laminated between them and it slowly releases the pheromone. Um, these things are loaded onto a hopper and mixed with a sticker which are then sprayed out of airplanes and the, the, um, this disrupts the ability of males to find females um, and um, it's been quite successful at, at suppressing these populations along the expanding gypsy moth population front. Um, one of the kind of cool things about this program is there's a lot of amazing technology that's gone into it. That uh, one of the things is that in, in this program, uh, I, I think I mentioned with the detection and eradication program, there are about 100,000 traps put every year in the, out in the uninfested area. In in the um, in the slow spread program, also deploys about 100,000 traps. If you look at this map, this, if you were to zoom in, each of these little dots represents a thermal trap, and so. It's an amazing thing that these trappers go out, they place the pheromone traps, they use uh, handheld GPSs to, to geolocate the traps. 
All the data is fed in from these GPSs to a central GIS, which is then used to, to make decisions about where treatments should be performed the next year. Um, and so it's, it's quite, and I should add that if any of you are interested in the Solis Bed project, one of the cool things about it is all these data, um, anybody can go in and, and look at the data, at what the trap captures were, where the treatments have been, where they're going to be, um, and, and there's a follow-up um, uh, 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 surveys that are done following treatments to monitor the effectiveness. It's really a very impressive program. Um, and it's also a very effective program. The, the prior to Gypsy Moth, the, the program uh, really, even though it's a national program, it didn't kick into 19, 1999. Um, there were some pilot projects in this program, even going back to the uh, early 1990s. Um, and what we've seen is that once this project has been put in place, this, this, his annual spread rates, they dropped from what were previously somewhere over 20 kilometers per year down to 10 kilometers per year or less. So the program has definitely been a big success in terms of reducing gypsy moth spread and, and reducing, uh, postponing the date at which uh, the gypsy moth is going to spread into some of these new uninfested areas. So the final um, uh, gypsy moth management uh, tactic that I was going to mention is suppression. And this is what's done in the area that's, uh, cons that we call the generally infested area where gypsy moth is established. And basically the objective of suppression is, is, to, when, is to suppress outbreak populations to prevent defoliation. And in the, in the, um, this is something that's been going on for many years. And in the, in the early um, 70s and 80s, most of the treatments were done using chemical pesticides. Um, since then, most of the um, most of the treatments in the sort of modern era have been done using um, uh, bacterial pesticides, mostly Bt. Um, so primarily because of concerns about the environmental impact of chemical pesticides. Um, one of the things you can see from this graph is that in years where we have lots of defoliation, like in the early 80s and the early 90s, that's when we have lots of suppression. So you can see. The, the sort of periodicity in the gypsy moth outbreaks here. Um, uh, usually the area that's treated for suppression is usually less than a tenth, however, of the area defoliated because most most areas don't get treated. There's just simply not enough money and there's probably not an adequate justification for, for treating all the areas that are going to be um, defoliating. One of the tricky things with, with suppression is actually predicting defoliation because obviously you only want to uh, there's no point in, in treating area, areas um, unless you think it's going to be defoliated. And, and the method that we use for predicting defoliation is usually based on densities of overwintering egg masses. So the method that's normally used is we put in a series of these 1 40th acre uh, circular plots in a stand. Um, and then based on essentially averaging counts, there's a, 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 a statistical relationship between egg mass density and, and defoliation. You can see there's a lot of scatter in this relationship. In other words, we often don't have a very good certainty of whether, given a given egg mass density, we don't know for sure it's going to be defoliated. But most, in most um, suppression programs, they'll use a, a threshold density of either something like 200 egg masses per acre or 500 egg masses per acre to decide whether or not to, to treat an area. Um, and the, the Forest Service, uh, Forest Health Protection um, provides, they have a, a, a cooperative suppression program. Um, so um, in may, not all states participate in this program, but, but many states participate in this program where the Forest Service will pay some fraction of the cost of aerial suppression. Uh, it varies different states. Some states, the rest of the cost is paid by the state. Um, in other states, it's all paid by the landowner, uh, but somewhere that essentially that cost of, of treating is, is shared by the landowner, the, the, um, the state government, and the, um, the federal government. In, in areas where they don't participate in, in this program, usually um, the, the landowner pays 100% of the cost, um, and they will just have to contract out with, directly with um, companies to do the aerial spraying. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that when, when a state is initially um, becomes infested, and this is just a phenomenon, I'm just showing data for West Virginia as an example, you see a very similar 
a kind of pattern in other states. When an area, a state first becomes infested, there's a little more interest in, in suppression. So you can see the first big outbreak in West Virginia, the area defoliated was, the area sprayed was about the same as the area defoliated. But then in subsequent outbreaks, the, the area defoliated is much less than the area sprayed, just because people realize they don't have the resources to spray everything, and they maybe realize that maybe they don't need to spray um, all these areas. Um, uh, but do you th and the other thing I think to keep in, it's important to keep in mind is that uh, these suppression programs, they generally tend to be pretty effective, not 100%, but they tend to be effective. This, you can see a, a spray a block border area of treated and untreated. Um, and they tend to be very effective uh, at, at protecting the foliage in a given year. Um, but what we find is that suppression never stops an outbreak. In other words, the area that's treated is relatively small, and so the, the outbreaks generally tend to run their course no matter whether there was some spraying going on in, in one area or another. And so really what you, can ex what you really can expect to accomplish from def suppression is to protect foliage for a year. Um, you're not going to stop an outbreak. Um, so the last thing I was going to mention is a little bit about um, silvicultural approaches to managing um, gypsy moth. And again, this is something, obviously, it's something that people would be most interested in the generally infested area. It's also something that probably is best considered ahead of, of when, when gypsy moth uh, outbreaks start, uh, um, uh, start in, in an area. And, Really, there are kind of three different approaches to silvicultural management um, or silvicultural uh, activities that may be taken. Um, so one strategy is simply to reduce the density of gypsy moth hosts in order to reduce the stand susceptibility. In other words, as I mentioned before, the, the probability of a stand being, the probability or an intensity of defoliation is very closely related to the fraction of of hosts in, in, in a stand. And so if you thin a stand to reduce the, reduce the component of oaks or other preferred species, then ahead of time, then you're probably going to likely reduce the probability of, of defoliation in that stand. Um, the other thing you can do is, is reduce the stand vulnerability. That is the probability of having uh, a lot of tree mortality by thinning to remove uh, low vigor stands. And again, this is something that definitely should be uh, conducted well ahead of, of a gypsy moth outbreak starting in your area because there's no point in doing this uh, generally once the outbreak has, has started. And then, of course, the third thing is salvage, that, that once, uh, it, it, there, you know, you do see these situations where you, you do sometimes get quite high levels of, of tree mortality, and some of the, the loss uh, to tree volume can be recovered by salvaging trees, although uh, as you can imagine, the, the value of trees quite quickly deteriorates as the time since the tree mortality progresses. Um, and um, in, in closing, I just want to say a few things about, you know, sort of the future of gypsy moth in the United States that, you know, because gypsy moth has taken so slow to expand its range, we still don't have much experience with gypsy moth in a lot of area, other areas. We think that the gypsy moth now, it only occupies probably about a third of the land area where, where outbreaks are eventually going to occur. So there's definitely some areas in, in the southern Appalachians that we know are very highly susceptible, and eventually the gypsy moth will, will get to those locations. Uh, same is true as parts of the Cumberland Plateau. Uh, uh, but the, the area that we always tend to think of uh, as sort of the promised land for the gypsy moth is probably the Ozarks, which we know it's a very high area with uh, almost pure oak stands or, or also oak pine stands, which we know are very highly susceptible to, to gypsy moth defoliation. So programs like the Slow Spread Program are doing a great job at, at postponing the date at which these areas are going to become infested. But we know eventually those areas will, and, and it, it's probably not going to be a pretty sight. Uh, probably even farther off in the future, we know in the West Coast there are areas um, that are probably prone to gypsy moth defoliation. Um, a lot of the sites in, in, say, coastal California are very similar looking to, to places in the Mediterranean region where we know oak uh, stands there, and those kind of climates are highly susceptible to defoliation. Uh, 
It's not just oaks, but some of the northern California, southern Oregon, Pacific Madrone is also known to be a very good gypsy moth host, and we can expect defoliation there. So that's really all I had to say. I guess um, I'm only slightly over my time with all the technical glitches, um, Dave. Um, yeah. If people have questions they want to ha ask, I'd be... If, by the way, one of the things, let me type in my email address, because I, I, I really am happy to answer any questions about the gypsy moth or anything like this, um, from whether a person is an extension agent, a scientist, or just a homeowner. I... Uh, there, there aren't many of us that work on the gypsy moth anymore, and, and so being one of the few people that do, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about it and glad to talk about it. Thank you, Sandy, and thanks a lot for all the great information you gave in this presentation.